Thank you very much indeed, Alheri, and thank you for this warm welcome. It's great to be here in Google uh, in Dublin. I'm delighted as a Scotsman. I'm in a country where people might have a chance of uh, understanding my accent, uh, although I hear there's about 70 different nationalities around the rooms, and this is going out on, uh, internationally. So I'll try and speak slowly and clearly if I, if I can. And yeah, I've got about 40 minutes, a few slides, mostly pictures, don't worry. And um, really one key message for you, and that's that I firmly believe that Google has the potential to do more than any other organization on the planet to drive change and make the place a better world. And I want to talk about the role that you can have as employees as part of that story. That's my key message. But let's just look at the world today as it is, and you can see from the first slide there, that's a picture. That's not Dublin, by the way. Does anyone know where that, uh, that picture's taken? Yeah. Not New Delhi? No. Brazil. Sao Paulo. It could be Dublin. I mean, there are places like that. And you don't need me to tell you that the world's in a fairly difficult place at the moment. You can read it in the newspapers. You can maybe even find it on Google climate change, inequality. I'm told actually at the moment, Oxfam say that about 40 or so people, it changes each year, have as much wealth as the other half of humanity, almost 4 billion people combined. That is not sustainable economically, I would say morally, and certainly not environmentally. Who's going to solve the problem? Traditionally, we turn to the nonprofit sector, the United Nations the charities, and there are many based all around the world. I would say they're doing great work, under-resourced, not lacking, not really having the scale that we need to match the, the problem. So we can't put it all onto the charities. Or what about government, politics? Well, I am apolitical. Google is probably apolitical. What I would say is that we are seeing a rise in populism all around the world. We are seeing politics shifting to the extremes of right and left. We're also seeing that international aid that was normally sort of channeled from individual citizens' taxes towards um, developing countries, let's say, of all the countries that signed up to a UN pledge in 1970, six, six countries have actually met that pledge of 0.7% of their GDP. So for various reasons, with democracy and populism, I'm not sure that government is going to be the answer. So what about business? What about we as business people? Do we have a role to play in this? People normally say in business, and certainly through my career, it's said, well, you know, we make things. We are companies. Our job is to make profit. And from that profit, we pay our taxes, and that can be used to address these issues. There's one problem with that at the moment. Corporations aren't paying their taxes very much. A little bit of a contentious issue. I'm not here to, to uh, insult my hosts in any way, but so I'll use a different organization. <laughs> I'll use a different organization. I want to have a little bit of audience participation, and I'll ask you some questions from time to time. And I do have a grand prize uh, coming up, which is going to be a bottle of whiskey. But that's for a question. Uh, yeah, ooh. <laughs> Scottish whiskey. Single malt whiskey. I kid you not, generosity of Scots knows no bounds. <laughs> Who paid more tax in the UK, across the, the water, last year? Amazon or Chelsea Football Club? Chelsea. Chelsea. Well, it's worse than that. One single player in Chelsea paid more tax than, is it the largest or certainly one of the largest organisations in the world? And do you know who this is? Kante, yeah, no whiskey for that, too easy. <laughs> so, that doesn't affect Google whatsoever at all. I mean, you paid a lot more tax than Amazon. In fact, there's probably three Chelsea players, in fact, that uh, earned as much. <laughs> I'm joking, I move on. My point is that business has grown in the last few decades 
enormously, exponentially, more than governments, more than these NGOs that I've talked about, it's grown enormously. And the size of scale of business at the moment is huge. And with that scale, I believe comes potential to drive change. Coca-Cola, everyone recognizes that iconic image, always within an arm's length of desire. First quiz question, how many liters of water would it take to make one liter of Coca-Cola? Oh, OK, hands up for A, three. No one, oh, one. I love the fact when there's one, no, no, it's OK, keep the hand up. <laughs> it's good, you know, higher. You're wrong, but it's great. <laughs> I like people, I, we'll come back to that, but it's great. What's your name? Jess. Jess, thanks, Jess. It's not three liters. And hands up for B, 33. A few more. Safety in numbers. Hands up for 53. Even more. D, 253. Ah. The right answer is D. Why? Why? Is it the, okay, the manufacturing process? No, it's actually the sugar cane. It's three liters for that, what you're talking about, to the, the production processes and the heat. 250 liters to grow the sugar, to grow it. Now, if you're making it in Ireland, it doesn't really matter. You've got a lot of rain here. But if you're making it in India or elsewhere, that's a problem for Coca-Cola. And if we want to use less water, then maybe we should start with Coca-Cola. Here's another example um, closer to where I am based in Switzerland. So here's a, a Swiss company, one of the biggest companies in the world, Nestle. How many customers does Nestle serve in a single day in the next 24 hours? 14 billion. Anybody for A? Jess? No? <laughs> Somebody else puts their hand up. Yeah. Yes. Can we double count I don't really know that officially we're talking we're talking customers, people that are actually contacted, touched. One person breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Oh, yeah, you could be 14 billion. I knew you guys are so smart in Google. I knew you're so smart. Um, I believe it is actual portions or, or servings in some way. So B, 1.4 billion. A lot of people. C, 140. D, 14 million. It's too small, right? Too small. The answer is B, 1.4, which is enormous, right? I mean, if you care about water, plastic bottles in the ocean, uh, nutrition, then love them or hate them, speak to Nestle or join Nestle and do something about their packaging, do something about that. You can, have, you can reach so many people. So that's my point, is just these super tankers, these enormous organizations, if they shift by just one degree, left or right, a little bit more of that or a little bit less of this, then it can have enormous impact down the line. The challenge, certainly in my experience in business, is what I call binary thinking. We've got on one hand, our core business, and you hear this a lot, core business, where we make our money, our profit, the shareholders. And over here is where we do our good. Corporate social responsibility, philanthropy, shared value, whatever. And this is obviously 99% and this is, you know, a, a bit of the rest. Clearly these things have to converge. They are converging. We need to find ways of doing good business and having an impact on the planet at the same time. That said, there is still, I believe, an outdated stereotype portrayed by the media of business. We're all meant to have horns and be greedy and, you know, the apprentice is dog-eat-dog dog in terms of these teams and, and Dragon's Den where somebody sits with a pile of cash and takes half your business for, you know, small amount of investment because they've got the money. It makes great TV. My mum loves that stuff. She was a teacher. She loves Apprentice. She loves Dragon's Den. But I don't think it's an accurate portrayal. We need to change the narrative around business. We need to reimagine what business can do and who it might serve. And there are signs that things are changing. Here's the, here's the big ticket item. Here is the, the prize question. Okay, so get your, I'm just keeping you all on tenterhooks so as you can pay attention. Who said this? Without a sense of purpose, no company, either public or private, can achieve its full potential. And uh, hands up, yeah? Not Steve Jobs, I'm gonna make it easier. I'm gonna give you a choice of three. <laughs> 
He is a well-known character in these uh, parts of the, the world. Who's that? Pope Francis. Less well-known for the younger ones around you. Gordon Gecko from the film Wall Street, late 80s. Loved it. And number C, and, and C, sorry? Mohammed Yunus, Nobel Peace Prize winner. Hands up for A while I get the prize. Nobody. B. Few for B. C. And the answer is, you're all wrong. It's a trick question. Not because I'm not going to give you whiskey, because I am. The answer is, that's a fictitious character. Who's the modern day Gordon, Gordon Gecko, in your opinion, prize coming? I'll be back. Can you think of one? Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett good guess. Anyone else? Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Are you ready? I'll tell you what, this was heavy and expensive. First one to say it. Warm, warm. That's Larry, and who, who is he? Who is Larry Fink? People don't know who Larry Fink is? Anybody heard of BlackRock? Six trillion worth of assets. This chap here controls about 4% of the US Fortune 500. And when he says something, people listen. And when he says things like that in his annual letter, his shareholders went, or sorry, his companies that were, he was investing in, panicked. He's going to disinvest from organizations that don't have a purpose. So we're starting to think differently about business. We are starting to imagine different rhetoric, different, let's, let's challenge these kind of received wisdoms that we get about how business should work. So I'm going to do a little bit of it. This is practice, you know, your brief mindfulness this afternoon I'm going to give you is just going to close your eyes and even just before, yeah, take a deep breath. Um, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> deep breath and just imagine, not the world as it is, but as, as, it, as it could be, but just imagine the world as it is today. Think of a map of the globe. Your idea of the world. And open your eyes. And how many of you are thinking of this? How many of you honestly... Jess might have been, she's, a, she's the, the odd one out. She's the one that can think out the box. I don't think we, we're told that the world is a different way around. I think in Australia, they sometimes have this thing. Believe it or not, I did this presentation in Australia. They said, yeah, sometimes we have the world upside down. Australia's at the, at the top. But it's not unusual. What, think of your, close your eyes again, another deep breath, and just think of your favorite painting. It could be one in your house. It could be one in the art gallery. It could be a famous one. And open your eyes, and how many of you were thinking of this? You were. Love it. What's your name? Uh, Katerina, who's my favorite artist. Like favorite, who is? Pollock. Pollock, Jackson Pollock. This was around about the early 50s, I think. I love it. So I'm not sure how well this went down in the art world in the 1950s when, you know, I, I can imagine that the reactions were a bit mixed. But I love it as well, and I love his work, but it's a little bit out there, right? Last, last one just to think about. Eyes closed, deep breath, and most influential political leader today. We open our eyes. Got somebody in mind? Were, you, were we thinking Greta Thunberg? Or the kids the, from the, the Partling shooting? I'm being a bit controversial deliberately, but these kids weren't even old enough to vote, let alone work in Google. They were told, like I was told, if you want to influence things, you wait till you're 18, you get a vote, and then you vote in elections when they come around, and then you hope that your party gets in. <laughs> She's 16 years old, for goodness sake, Greta Thunberg, sailing around the world to conferences to keep her carbon footprint down. I, I would suggest that these people are, have got huge political influence. They are thinking differently. They are breaking from the herd. 
This is one of my favourite slides, I have to say. I'll explain to you why, but let me ask you, which, which was the right way to go here? Was it to the left or was it to the right? To the right? Well, which way are you looking? Okay, the one person going to the right. Maybe it was to the right. Maybe the majority went to the left. Or maybe they're all wrong. And truth is sometimes stranger than fiction, but about a month ago, I read in the papers, this is absolutely true, that in Switzerland, where I live, there was a flyby arranged by jets to do this demonstration. <laughs> and they were to fly by uh, an event in a village. And he did this great flyby and zoomed over the village at great speed with their, with their tail things going. And it was fantastic. The only problem was they got the wrong village. <laughs> it's absolutely true. The squadron leader had evidently, you know, seen a, a village with a big tent up and um, thought that that was where they were going. And it was seven kilometers away from where they were meant to be. And there was a yodeling festival going on in this other village. And you can just imagine people kind of yodeling and then suddenly, <laughs> God, what was that? They didn't expect to fly by, but anyway. So, you know, who's right, who's wrong in these things? Um, it's a bit worrying to think that these kind of technical jets don't actually have as much GPS in there as your average car, but uh, we can break from the height from the herd, we can go in a different way. And that's essentially how I would describe the notion of an entrepreneur, a social entrepreneur who is working within a large organization. I'm sure there are entrepreneurs amongst this group here and certainly in the wider Google. The first definition, you can read it, it's about working in a large corporation. You're given the freedom, I would argue a bit with that, but to create new products, services, systems, and you don't have to follow the corporation's protocols. I prefer the second definition. A dreamer who does. A dreamer who does. We can all dream. We don't all follow through on our dreams. Hands up here. Who has heard of Nick Hughes? No one's heard of Nick Hughes. I can tell you, I didn't know him before he was famous, by the way. He's not famous. He should be famous. Nick Hughes used to work for Vodafone. And Vodafone, who's heard of M-Pesa? M-Pesa, yeah. Um, I know there's some people here from Africa. And M-Pesa is the mobile banking. And it was born not out of the corporate R&D department or the boardroom, but this kind of crazy idea. And I think history has often been rewritten. I'm sure there's a, a, a great um, example or case study of, of corporate sponsored innovation in Vodafone that led to mobile banking that is revolutionizing how we transfer money between us. The truth is a bit different when you speak to Nick, and I did. You know, you can imagine, you know, you want to do what? How much investment? To do what? Where in Africa? The mobile phone is a bank account? Are you crazy? Where's this in your annual objectives? Something like that. It wasn't until the UK government's aid arm gave a million taxpayers money that the whole thing was catalyzed and M-Pesa took off. And I would say it's one of the most significant and impactful innovations that there's been in international development. Most of the Kenyan GDP goes through M-Pesa. Another example, someone you may or may not have heard of, Miriam Sidibi. No, perhaps not. Again, I wouldn't expect you to yet. I think you will in the future. Miriam Sidibi, I first met in 2006. She was speaking at a conference, uh, a young woman from Africa, and, and she, she spoke about the fact that her mother is, was in the UN, that her dad had been in the UN, and she was meant to go into the UN. She had done a PhD in, in health, global health, and hygiene, and hand washing. She wasn't going to go into the UN. She was going to go join Unilever instead. And she was going to market soap. And she was going to touch a billion lives, was her dream, by educating people as to why they wash their hands with soap and water. So many kids are dying of easily treatable infections from just poor hygiene. And I lost touch with Miriam. And then we met again 2013, I think it was, in Nairobi for dinner. And by this time, she was the social mission director of Lifebuoy Soap, working in Unilever. I said, that's an amazing job title. How, how did you get that job? She said, I made it up. She made up her job title. Unilever said, OK. 
And there she is in this contagion, positive contagion to other brands. You see some of these other brands that Unilever are making that have a inbuilt purpose. They're doing stuff at the moment around bullying in schools with young people. They've got brands with, a, you know, the pop band has kind of got bullying insults all over them. And it's, it's just showing how they can change hearts and minds through brands. So that was done by Miriam. I'll, um, I don't class myself up there with these. These are my heroes and heroines, if you will, of the entrepreneurship movement. Um, my personal story, I've, I know you've got uh, books. Uh, some of you have been given books. Uh, the best way actually to sell books is just to give them away, actually. I find that's uh, it's great for sales. I'm working on an audio book at the moment, so the voice is going to have to be recorded and subtitled and, and whatever. But I'll give you the five minute audio book or the four minute audio book. Um, so I started my career in the 80s, and I'd love to tell you that I was, you know, from a teenager wanting to change the world, and I was a young Greta Thunberg equivalent. I wasn't. I wanted to go into business, make money, have a Porsche, and an Amex gold card. That was my ambition. A bit shallow, I admit it. Uh, I had a bit of a wake-up call in my early 30s. I went volunteering in the Balkans. I realized there was an opportunity to volunteer and give my business skills to build capacity and help small businesses in the Balkans just after the Kosovo crisis. And I was on something like a 95% salary reduction. But I'd never been more motivated in my life. I was jumping out of bed in the morning. I could see directly the impact that my skills were having on this community, helping develop business plans, training women entrepreneurs, doing e-business training. This is about 20 years ago. And I came back consciously deciding to stay in the company and to try and create a different kind of company, to try and think a bit out the box and challenge the received wisdom. Most people said business is for profit and charities are not, you know, non-profit making, not for profit. What about a not for loss business? So I led a team and it was very much a team effort that created a not for loss business called Accenture Development Partnerships. And we were something of a, a guerrilla movement. This is my guerrilla movement I, uh, metaphor here. Strange how these kind of old bandit pictures have a real diversity issue. They always tend to just be uh, men in the bandits. But we were a kind of guerrilla movement. We were a mixed, diverse group of people that wanted against the odds to try and turn Accenture's business model on its head. So conventional wisdom says we take people, we pay them a lot of money, we, we add an overhead and a margin, and we charge clients for our services. It's not really rocket science at all. We said, what if people will work on half their salary? And what if they're prepared to work on the ground in places where there's a greatest need, but there's a least access to their, their business skills and their technology expertise? What if charities that usually take money from business could actually buy services? And what if Accenture would forgo profit? People said, Accenture's a profit-making organization. Why would it do it? Why would people take a salary reduction? But they did, and against the odds, we succeeded. And when we got out there and started working with many of the biggest brand name organizations that many of you maybe donate to or volunteer for, Care International, Oxfam, Save the Children, we worked for Irish NGOs like Concern and Goal, United Nations, UNICEF. We couldn't tell them much about international development and uh, how poverty could be alleviated or how we do health systems. We could tell them about business processes. We could re-engineer their back offices. We could look at knowledge management and how they did, did that better. Change management, strategic development. We could use technology to train nurses and doctors and community health workers through e-learning platforms. It's not, again, we take this stuff for granted. It wasn't taken for granted in that sector. So we could have a big impact by complementing their skills. And over time, we grew and were somewhat successful. Um, we got awards. I got a promotion, lucky me. I was in a salary reduction, as were all my colleagues, but the money didn't matter. We were loving what we were doing. And the firm was supporting us. And the people who had said, you know, you're so crazy to think anyone's gonna work on half their salary. Well, after 10 years, 50,000 people were on the waiting list to half their salary. Show me another company around the world that has 50,000 people saying, I want to work on the other side of the world 
on half of what you're paying. It, it, it goes against conventional wisdom. And, you know, we were on a something of a pedestal and if people are in pedestals, you know what sometimes happens to people in pedestals. The wheels come off. I thought after 10, 12 years that we were out the woods, that we were doing well, and we, we were, but there were challenges. I described the challenges really as, as the corporate immune system, the antibodies of the corporate, that I think many companies, including the one I was in, have this invisible system that tries to snuff out anything that doesn't quite look like it's going to maximize shareholder value next quarter. You are a malignant growth. You should be snuffed out. I'm talking about just attitudes. I'm talking about culture. I'm talking about middle managers doing their job, enforcing the rules, following policy. Because we'd grown to the size where when we were small, we could get round policies. We could break the rules. And it was quite fun. When you're big, and as I say, a quarter of a billion worth of services in 10 years, we, we got on the radar of the people who decided we needed to comply. And eventually it all became a bit too munch, much. Who are the artist people in here? Edvard Munch. The scream, ah! Also got no hair as well, you can see from there. I think that's a coincidence. I use this as, a, again, a metaphor. I don't exactly know what happened. I talk about it in the book, but I had been in India on a retreat. I came back with a fever. The fever catalyzed a, a manic episode, and I found myself inside a psychiatric hospital in Scotland. Me, I, I, was, I loved my job. I was healthy otherwise. I had enough money, I didn't have to worry about that. I came from a good family. I lived in a beautiful city in Switzerland. And there I was in this place. And if it can happen to me, I felt it can happen to anyone. And what do you do when a crisis hits? You, well, I decided to write a book. You can't, you can't choose what happens to you. You can only choose your response. And why did I write the book that some of you have got copies of? Well, the first and primary driver is actually one of breaking taboos. And I'm deliberately making this presentation fairly lighthearted and I want to, to get to some Q&A. But this is the one serious point that I will make, is that there is an endemic crisis in businesses. I'm sure Google is no different. It looks a happy place and a great company, but every company, I think, is suffering. And the statistics are that one in four of you in this room will at some point in your lives have an experience with mental health, anxiety, or depression, or something like what happened to, to me. That's just the stats. Empirically, from the people I've spoken to over the last few years, I think these stats understate the problem. More like one in three, one in two of the people I speak to, quietly and in confidence, they start to tell me. So I felt that I needed to speak up about this. Not because I'm brave or that I think my story is any different, but I just felt I was not being wholly truthful by saying that I had an illness and I had to leave the company. So it's about speaking up. And more of us need to speak up. But I also believe that the response in business is at the moment wholly inadequate to the crisis. We treat mental health as if it's a failure of the individual to adapt to the system. You can't cope with the pressure of the working environment or the long, you're, you, 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 you have, you're not up to it. It's seen as a weakness. And I'm actually saying, I think that's wholly wrong. We have to look at the mental health of the system. We have to look at the mental health of the organizations that are causing us to be dropping like flies and burning out all over the place. And I know there's a lovely pinball things up there and free canteens and gym memberships and massage at the desk. And you probably have yoga classes in here that are all free. But really, I mean, for me, we have to not just tinker around the edges, but fundamentally reimagine and rethink what business is about and who it's serving. And that leads me to the second point, the second reason for writing the book, which is the role that business can play in making the world a better place. These are the sustainable development goals. And my sense is that while they are seen as being the, the property of the United Nations, they were also co-created and agreed upon by business leaders. How we 
feed and nourish the next billion on the planet, and there will be another billion plus on the planet very soon. How we provide them access to clean water, clean energy, sanitation, financial services. These are mouth-watering opportunities for business, I believe. We shouldn't see this as the CSR or philanthropic arm, philanthropic arm. We should see this as the opportunity. And the likes of Google and your parent Alphabet, I believe, can play in any of these SDGs and all of these SDGs. There are ways that your technology can touch working with others, maybe new business models, maybe new partnerships, maybe new joint ventures, but your technology can really make a big difference on these SDGs and at the same time make money for Google. It's as if you've got the, you've got the collective intelligence, if you will, at your fingertips of the world. What's missing, I think, is a raising of the collective consciousness of what needs to be done. And that's where the onus comes to leadership. Is the change going to come top down or bottom up? My sense is obviously bottom up. Um, I don't know how many of you ski around here. Quite a few skiers in Google, no doubt. You get time off to ski. Yeah. Skiing's not great around Dublin, but you'd probably go far and wide. Conventional wisdom says the higher up an organization you go, the better paid you are, the more experience you have, the more wisdom you have. Conventional wisdom says the higher up a mountain you go, the colder it gets. You go skiing and sometimes you find days like this. Temperature inversion, where it's actually warmer at the top and colder on the bottom when there's cloud in the valleys. We have a temperature inversion in the leadership in companies. My belief is that the, the higher up you go, Actually, the less propensity you've got, the less understanding, the less well equipped you are to deal with these challenges. I think when you're new, fresh, you've got more to gain, more ideas, more innovation. I'm sorry if there's more senior people in here, you can get with it, but I think that this is not about a hierarchical thing. It's not when I get the promotion, when I become SVP, if I became CEO, I would do the change. It starts today. And we're already seeing that sort of collective action by employees, employee activism in the workplace. And I applaud what you've been doing there in employee activism. It's difficult to move individually. And I know what it's like to stand out and be a bit different. I mean, I had lunch today in the canteen. Try being over 50 wearing a suit in the Google canteen. And you know what it's like to stand out and look differently. But my key point is here, we need to embrace people who are thinking out of the box. Diversity is not just about the talents of people who look differently or, 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 or have different genders or, or from different ethnic backgrounds. Diversity for me is about mindset. And if we want to really harness the power of diversity, we harness the power of people who think differently. And with Google Walkouts, you can collect, you don't have to be the odd one out. You can be, it's great if you are. What happened to Microsoft? Did you read about Microsoft's um, CEO letter? One person must have had the idea last year, last summer, who said, you know, I don't want our technology being used to separate, separate immigrants from their families on the Mexican-US border, southern border of the US. Not in my name. I don't want this. I got 100 friends to come along and sign the letter. It was kind of ignored, I think, until it became a few thousand. A few thousand out of a company of, at the time, I think 114,000 was a couple of percent. But it changed the policy of the company. And the company decided that human rights would have to be part of its, every client's um, contract. You would think that would be something to do beforehand, but that's what happened as a result of this. They canceled the 20 million contract. So the power of employees, individually and collectively, is enormous. The book has some crazy ideas out there about um, how Elon Musk might run the UN or how we could crowdsource business strategy and things, but also it talks about democratizing the corporation. How, and I think we are starting to see the early signs of democracy, where people are using their vote. And if I think about the, the, the influences of business strategy over the next few years, it could be consumers, it could be marketing, it could be external environment. For me, I think employees of companies are going to exert the biggest influence in corporate strategy over the next few years. And your Google walkouts and strikes 
Hands up who went on strike at all? Are you allowed to show who went on strike? <laughs> oh no, we don't ask that, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Probably some of you did. I salute you if you did. But let's do that. Let's actually work to, to make that change. It doesn't have to be a big change. It can just be tapping that first domino. Craft that letter to the CEO, come up with that idea and take it to your boss. Make that phone call and push the domino over. For me, I have a new domino. And it's not actually a domino, it's more, this is a standing stone, 4,000 years old. I bought last year, uh, for 85,000 pounds, a ruined farm on the island, about two fields away from where I grew up, where the book starts off. And when I squint and close my eyes and I think a bit differently, I don't see a ruin and a pile of bricks in a few acres of land. I see a business decelerator, a place where business people can slow down, disconnect for a change, and connect with art and music and nature and community, and ultimately to their own personal purpose. That for me is what's lacking in business today. And I hope that maybe some of you might want to join in there. We could have a whole network of rural decelerators in Ireland and elsewhere. So, I'm leaving you with a thought of what your domino is. What is your domino? Can you dream big? You can start small, and the scaling, I'm sure, will take care of itself. A quote that I discovered recently and that really resonates with me, I'll read it out. Run from what's comfortable. Forget safety, live where you fear to live, destroy your reputation. Oh yes, be notorious. I have tried prudent planning long enough and from now on, I'll be mad. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask one or two questions, and now you guys have probably several questions you want to ask. Okay. Thanks for coming in. Fantastic. It's a great pleasure. Um, those of you lucky enough to have a book, read it. I, I'm honest, and I said it during lunch. I thought, oh, God, I have to read another business book. Right, and uh, I read it within two days. Fantastic. Very funny. I just want to ask two questions on the book, actually. You talk about leadership and your experience with leadership, um, how you've learned a lot about leadership through mistakes. You talk about Frank and other folks. Frank is just, the nemesis character. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Can you just give us some examples of the good and bad leadership? Well, I'm sure many people here will have their own, uh, their own examples um, of good and bad leadership. I think bullying in the workplace, I touch on some of these things around bullying in the workplace. It's a challenge in many companies. It's, I talk about the fact that silence is, is being complicit in some ways. When I felt that there was somebody was calling me out, embarrassing me in a meeting, making you feel small, that kind of activity. There's a lot of people, I think, that have grown up where that was a sign of power 10, 20, 30 years ago. I don't know what the average age is in Google. I'm sure it's quite young, but there are still some dinosaurs out there who think that that's the way to manage people. And then some of their peers don't speak up about it. So conversely, there's, I got some great leadership support. In the early stages, I had people who whose job it was not to support what we were doing. They just believed in what we were doing, they gave of their time, and they coached and served. Not in their job description, they didn't get anything for it, but leadership played a great role, but it can also be bad, so plenty of good and bad. The first thing, reading your book, from the beginning you say you knew what your purpose was. Quite early on, when you joined Accenture and then you had this idea. What do you say to people, to all of us who still don't know what it is? We're still looking. Yeah, I, well, I didn't really know what I wanted to do until I was 33 or something like that. So we're, we're, the system tells you that you come out of school and you should know what you want to study and know what career you want to go into. My career weaved and so no, I didn't know what I, I didn't know what my purpose was when I went into Accenture. It's still evolving. And I wouldn't want anybody to be stressed out because they don't have a feeling, oh my God, I don't have a personal purpose. I think it will come to you. And, and the problem is we are all having this kind of 
individual and collective attention deficit disorder. We're all so busy doing what we're doing that we don't have a time to think about where we're going and what it is that's ultimately calling us. Why are we here? What is it beyond just hitting these annual objectives? So there is, there, there's no silver bullet answer to that, but I think getting quiet, reflecting, taking the time out and thinking about what it is you could do. And I'm not suggesting people then leave and join the charities or the UNs. I'm saying stay put. Don't change companies, change the company that you're in. And Google's doing great things. It can do so much more. Yeah, uh, just a question around how you reconcile the conflict between the sustainable development goals and how companies are focused on, on profit and really how the free market is based on growth. So you know, how, do you, how do you stop from getting down? On, if you're saying government can, won't do it, uh, you know, it, how many dominoes <laughs> is that going to require, I suppose, even if you're sure. trying to shift uh, the, the tanker? So um, what I didn't mention, I, I understand there is this quarterly short-term profit, um, again, um, target and control and, and expectation. There's a report that came out in 2018 by the UN Business Commission that estimated that the business opportunity, the market opportunity across the SDGs is about 12 to 13 trillion dollars by 2030. There is value in these things that I've described, but it won't be done by business as usual and it might not be achieved next quarter. So I'm, I, I'm not saying it's give up the profit. I'm saying think longer term and thinking new and different ways about where that profit can come from. Vodafone's M-Pesa is not a CSR initiative. They're making some good money out of bringing financial inclusion and goodness knows what else has come from that. So I, I, I think it's, I, I genuinely believe it's a huge business opportunity. We just have to think out the box and create the new business models, almost a, a fourth sector. We've got the private sector and the public sector and the third sector. What about a new business ecosystem that rewards outcome? a marketplace for outcomes, social outcomes. We just change and recalibrate business and what it's about. Thanks for the question. Any others? Yeah. Hey, um, I guess a bit of a follow-up on that because it's also on the SDGs. Um, so I think there's 16 to 17 in Contra Core. They're all very 17. important. 17. 17. So they're, they're all very important. 301 indicators and it's, it's a bit yeah, clunky. Yeah. So, so look, there, there, there's a lot to kind of focus on. Um, and as you said, that the market's quite big as well. Um, but what would you think probably would be the most important, and let's, let's keep it localized for us in Google, that, that maybe you think we should focus on? And, and, and I'm not saying that necessarily it's you turn around and say, okay, you should do this and now, but, but kind of holistically, you talk, use dom, domino metaphors as well. They're all interlinked. So is the one that you think is, is the most important for corporate to actually try and address? I think some corporates, uh, you know, there's, there's the, Corporates naturally gravitate towards, you know, pharmaceutical companies towards the health SDGs and resources and energy companies towards the energy SDGs. I, I actually think that sometimes the biggest opportunity for companies is in adjacent sectors to them or partnering with people with complementary strengths. An organization like Google, I, I think you are, you are cutting across, you are horizontal, you are in an enabling thing, uh, environment, and you know your technology better than I do, but, um, you know, how the mapping technology, the search engine, the knowledge that you have. I just think we have to empower people to think very, very differently. And I know you're starting to, to do that. And, and probably that means speaking to people from outside of your domains, maybe outside of the private sector, certainly outside of your normal partners. So business to business collaboration, entrepreneur to entrepreneur collaboration, you know, I don't know, go and spend a year in a slum in Africa and come back. And if you haven't had an idea, um, and many people have done that through volunteering. Is there a volunteering program in, in Google? I think these things, if we, we see them as a sort of time out and that's great and everybody wants to do it. But if we combine that with innovation in some way, you want to think out of the box, go and live out the box for a while. I don't have the answers for you, but the answers haven't been thought up, but they're there, I'm convinced. Ask me again in five years time and you'll have answered it or your colleagues. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I think the stat you had about Kante, the football player, and Amazon paying taxes was really interesting. And a lot of these goals could be achieved with more investment from our taxes. Uh, what are your opinions about moves very slowly to a harmonized tax structure around the world? Um, I, 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 I'm no expert on 
taxation. Uh, I think the tax system does need to be solved at a global level, multilaterally, rather than one country. We know there's, that's very pertinent to the Irish situation at the moment. But I think it's hygiene. I genuinely think it's hygiene. I am not in the camp of let's demonize business, hammer them from taxes, and you know, bring them to their knees in some way. I'm saying it's the upside, it's the innovation, it's the new com untapped commercial value in these areas that is where the big action is. Taxes, hygiene, do it, pay it, we should pay more. It's an absurdity, what I described, but it's not the solution in itself. Some people do see it as the solution, I don't see it as the solution in itself. Thanks, Vinod, yeah, that was a really great talk. Um, uh, before my role here at Google, I worked a lot with entrepreneurship programs in, like corporates would have their entrepreneurship program over 12 weeks, so companies, so employees were able to go for 12 weeks, they were mentored, um, they rolled out their ideas, and if they were successful, they were brought back into the company. But a lot of the time, if there were bigger ideas that needed a separate entity, something bigger and impactful, they would have to be spun off a little bit, but then would not be long-term successful because of the, the big ship kind of operating around, you know, the processes and procedures that the startup be kind of idea needed. So what would your advice be to try and, first of all, get the corporate on board with your idea to roll it out and then to help it become long-term successful? You're asking someone who was wholly unsuccessful at doing that, and this is not false modesty. I, what you, the question you ask is very dear to my heart. I think we, we got to a stage where we were, we'd been going 12 years. By all intents and purposes, we were, we'd done some, some great things against the odds without there have being an entrepreneurship program. This was, but the more I saw the potential to go and maybe spin out and do other things, the more I was finding myself having to justify to new groups of leaders coming in what we were doing a few years ago. And, there, and the, the rules that were applied, you know, just childlike errors in terms of how we were not nurturing and treating as a startup. If you apply the same rules to a hundred billion organization, you apply it to startup, you're going to kill it. So um, I failed to convince uh, a new brand of leadership as the, the potential that I, I saw. So um, the wrong person to ask, but um, I hope, and by having these conversations and these presentations, and by trying to convince leadership, and when I speak to, let's say, leaders in business, I'm saying, come on, you have Elon Musk or Richard Branson or branson S type characters. You need to find ways of harnessing that innovation potential and nurturing them. And then when the fruits of that come out, find ways of not killing them inadvertently. It is inadvertently. Do you think we're a bit far away from that in terms of the reality of the impact? So like At the moment, probably a bit far away from that. But um, I think there are some, you can see that some leaders, a CEO of Novartis talks about unbossing the company, which I think in this whole notion of, of hierarchical changes in companies going on. You know, the best thing leaders can do, I think, is empower people and then find ways of not just managing innovation along the tram lines, but embracing disruption and the, you know, the really disruptive stuff that wouldn't come out of the R&D labs. And we maybe are far away from that, but it surely can't be. You know, we, I'm hearing encouraging signs about how the performance management system is changing to reward behaviors as opposed to just rewarding ticking a, a, a target that you said a year ago. So. Um, I think we have to think about holistically across the whole company about how we're going to make that happen rather than just in, in one bit. So um, you mentioned um, if the change comes from top to bottom or bottom up, and <clears throat> I do be believe that it would come from bottom up. And in and, and a big corporation like this, um, we are being hired to do the, the job, right? Do, do what's assigned to us. And, and, um, and for HR and recruiting, looking at people who would actually do the job that's been assigned to them and not just dreamers who does. So do you have um, ideas or ways for HR recruitment to find people who with dreams and with purpose in life to bring to Google to actually implement these changes instead of hiring people who would just do the core jobs and get the salary and get out the building? So I think that's, to me, it's coming from a bottom up from us who would want to bring the change, but also from recruit, recruiting or HR to bring us, um, bring in the right people um, to the right company. I'm, I'm sure there's something that could be looked at in terms of the recruiting, you know, how we, we all recruit in our own images, right, in many ways. I'm sure recruitment is part of it, but I also 
really, really think that the brains and the, the, I mean, you're working in probably the most sought after company in the world. Congratulations for having a job here. I do think that we can do something with the individuals. This is what I'm trying to do with the decelerator. I do think it is about fundamentally unlearning certain things and, 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 and relearning other behaviors. We can do that, right? We, we, we're able to reprogram ourselves, I think. So partly recruitment, but partly let's, let's just fundamentally change the way we, we, we think in the organization, change the way we reward people, change the way we incentive people, change the North Star on what it is the company is actually about. And then we might see that smart people like yourselves will drive that change. You will be the change you want to see in your company. Thank you very much indeed for being here. I appreciate it very much. Thank, Thank you. you.